tonight, Modi wins. Celebrations ring out as Narendra Modi clinches a third win. But the nation's political future hangs in the balance with the BJP losing its majority. Urging peace. The US continues to rally for support on the latest Gaza deal, despite complaints from Israel. The situation in Gaza worsening by the day. Border crackdown. With the November elections looming ever closer, Biden pulls out all the stops to please the voter base through a tighter border policy, though it may prove too little too late. And facing off, Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer make their case to the public with a heated first debate that seems to cause some poll fluctuations. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ala Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening. You're joining us on World News. Thank you very much for tuning in tonight. There are lots of updates to report to you on from across the globe, as always. And we begin without any further ado in our neighboring India. With the elections rolling to a close, Narendra Modi is set to retain power. But his BJP party lost its outright parliamentary majority for the first time in 10 years. His NDA bloc secured 293 seats above the 272 mark needed to form a government. Modi thanked voters for their mandate and said that he would do everything to eradicate corruption and poverty in the nation. On this pious day, it is definite that the NDA will make a government for a third consecutive time. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi claimed a third consecutive term in office on Tuesday evening after a six-week-long election. His Bharatiya Janata Party, however, fell short of a 272-seat majority in the 543-seat Lok Sabha signifying a blow to his party's grip on power. The BJP won 240 seats, which is 63 seats fewer than in 2019. It still secured a majority through its allies in the National Democratic Alliance, which won a total of 293 seats. The opposition, India Alliance, led by the Indian National Congress Party, won 234 seats, a big surprise compared to 2019's 80 seats. Modi has been campaigning in full confidence of winning a two-thirds majority with a target of 400 seats. Despite the underwhelming performance, he celebrated at the BJP headquarters in New Delhi, saying that this is a victory for the world's largest democracy. As still in our region, we see a strain on delicate diplomatic ties as South Korea has officially suspended the entirety of the 2018 inter-Korean military agreement. This decision came amid North Korea's recent series of provocations, which included sending trash balloons. President Yoon Song yeol has signed the motion that was passed by the cabinet meeting on Tuesday morning to suspend all clauses of the 2018 inter-Korean military agreement. The government has decided to suspend all effectiveness of the September 19th military agreement until mutual trust between the two Koreas is restored, effective Tuesday, June 4th, as of 3 p.m., after the decision of the cabinet and the president's approval. The 2018 inter-Korean military agreement was aimed at defusing military tensions and preventing accidental military conflict at the border. But military officials, including South Korea's defense minister, have argued that the agreement compromises South Korean military readiness. Since signing the agreement, North Korea has deliberately and repeatedly conducted violations and provocations, including firing artillery shells off the coast, firing missiles beyond the NRL, firing at guard posts and infiltrating with small unmanned aerial vehicles. Back in November, North Korea declared a virtual termination of the September 19 military agreement. This came after Seoul partially suspended a clause on aerial reconnaissance following North Korea's launch of a military spy satellite the night before. Despite North Korea's repeated violations and provocations, our military has continued to abide by the agreement. 
However, since failing to launch the military reconnaissance satellites back on May 27th, the North has launched missiles, sent large-scale balloons carrying waste, and jammed GPS systems, gravely threatening the safety of our people and causing property damage. The deputy minister added that the North Korean regime is sorely responsible for the turn of events and warned of a firm response should the North engage in further provocations. With the suspension in effect, the deputy minister hinted of the possible resumption of military drills near the military demarcation line and the Northwest Islands. Such drills had been restricted by the agreement. The Kremlin said it was understandable that some countries were declining to take part in a Swiss-hosted peace summit on Ukraine this month because the gathering lacked clear goals and it was absurd to hold it without Russia. Ukraine says more than 100 countries and organizations have agreed to attend the summit, to which Moscow has not been invited. For more on this, we have other than the volume special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. What's the latest, Minoli? Yes, Sanuradi. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov said it is a completely absurd activity and said it was obvious the meeting was not geared towards results. And that's why many countries don't want to waste time. In a blow to Ukrainian president Vladimir Zelensky, China has said it will not take part, something Russian parliament speaker Vyacheslav Volody noted with satisfaction. He cited press reports saying Saudi Arabia would, go, would not go either, although the kingdom has not publicly announced its position on the summit. Peskov said that was a sovereign matter for Saudi Arabia. The meeting is taking place at a crucial point in the third year of the war in Ukraine, where Russian forces have recorded a series of gradual gains since February. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. We're in Israel now as Israeli authorities were on alert for new bushfires after munitions fired from Lebanon by Hezbollah the previous evening ignited several blazes across northern Israel. The Israel Fire and Rescue Service said dozens of firefighting teams worked through the night with teams from the Nature and Park Service, Army, Police and other agencies before the largest fires were brought under control in the morning. Forest fires continue to rage across northern Israel. They've reached residential areas in border towns and villages and several homes have been evacuated. The emergency services say the blaze is now under control. The fires broke out shortly after drone strikes fired by Hezbollah from neighbouring Lebanon on Monday. Hot and dry weather conditions then causing them to spread quickly. Israeli authorities have vowed to continue their fight against the militant group. In retaliation, the Israeli army announced it had carried out airstrikes against what it said were Hezbollah targets in southern Lebanon. Israel and Hezbollah continue to exchange cross-border fire amid soaring temperatures, some reaching over 40 degrees Celsius this week. The violence has forced tens of thousands to flee on both sides over the past few months, since the 7th of October. And as the rhetoric escalates and attacks intensify, many fear the conflict will turn into a full-blown war. Israeli ground forces even preparing for a potential invasion of Lebanon. Hezbollah has previously said it would halt its attacks when the war on Gaza ends. US President Joe Biden saying the conclusion of a hostage deal would unlock the possibility of a return to calm along the border. And now on the Israel-Palestine conflict, it seems the U.S. will continue to push the proposed ceasefire deal. A three-phase plan not being shown all too much enthusiasm on an international front as Israel continues to mull their stance on the gaps in the proposal. This comes with the situation in Gaza worsening by the day. The United States has urged the United Nations to accept a three-phase ceasefire and hostage deal between Israel and Hamas proposed by President Joe Biden. The plan would see an end to fighting in Gaza after nearly eight months, along with the release of all hostages and a huge increase of aid into the territory. U.S. Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield says the U.S. has sent a draft resolution to the 14 other council members, which includes a full and complete ceasefire within the first six weeks. It would also reiterate the council's commitment to a two-state solution and stress the importance of unifying the Gaza Strip and the West Bank under Palestinian authority. 
Hamas has said it views the proposal positively. But Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the offer still has gaps. Acceptance of the deal would also threaten Netanyahu's presidency, as ultra-nationalists say they'll bring down his government if he agrees to a ceasefire that doesn't completely eliminate Hamas. But if he rejects the deal, he risks worsening Israel's isolation from the international community and could come under fire for abandoning the hostages in favor of protecting his own position. It comes as the Palestinian death toll rises to more than 36,000, according to Gaza's health ministry, with thousands of people returning to find their homes in Khan Yunus turned to rubble after having fled to Rafa earlier in the war. Basic infrastructure in the area is lacking, with no available water, food or proper sewage system. Much of Gaza's 2.3 million population has been displaced since the war started and large parts of the territory have been destroyed. The United Nations has even warned of full-blown famine as humanitarian aid struggles to reach the Palestinian people. We're going in for a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We have some updates from the U.S. now. Amid mounting political pressure, U.S. President Joe Biden has announced that he would not grant asylum to those entering the U.S. illegally through its southern border. The decision comes weeks before his first television debate with Donald Trump. Doing nothing is not an option. We have to act. U.S. President Joe Biden announced new restrictions on migrants caught illegally crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. His executive order on Tuesday could deny those migrants the chance to claim asylum, and they could be quickly deported or turned back to Mexico. The Biden administration said the new measures will take effect immediately and will have exceptions for unaccompanied children, people who face serious medical or safety threats, and victims of trafficking. The sweeping enforcement effort, which is temporary, comes months after Congress failed to pass legislation. We came to a clear clear bipartisan deal. It was the strongest border security agreement in decades. But then Republicans in Congress, not all, but walked away from it. Why? Because Donald Trump told them to. He told the Republicans, it has been published widely by many of you, that he didn't want to fix the issue. He wanted to use it to attack me. Biden, a Democrat, has toughened his approach to border security as immigration has emerged as a top issue for Americans in the run-up to the November 5th elections, where he will face Trump, a Republican who has vowed a wide-ranging crackdown if re-elected. Registered voters prefer Trump over Biden on immigration policy by a 17-point margin. The new asylum policy is activated when the daily average of border arrests tops 2,500 over a week and will be paused when arrests drop below 1,500 per day, the official said. The last time crossings fell to that level was in the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic. This action will help us gain control of our border, restore order to the process. This ban will remain in place until the number of people trying to enter illegally is reduced to a level that our system can effectively manage. The new restrictions resemble similar policies implemented by Trump and use a legal statute that served as the underpinning for Trump's travel bans, blocking people from several majority Muslim nations and other countries. Biden said he will continue to work closely with the Mexican government on border issues and said he had spoken with President-elect Claudia Scheinbaum Monday. In advance of the announcement, Trump's campaign issued a statement criticizing Biden for high levels of illegal immigration and said the move to exempt unaccompanied minors would encourage child trafficking.
And election updates continue over in the UK as Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Labour challenger Keir Starmer went head to head over how to boost Britain's economy, with the PM accusing the opposition party of wanting to increase taxes if it wins power at a July election. You okay. want to put everyone's taxes right. up. Britain's Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and his Labour Party challenger Keir Starmer went head to head in a heated debate on Tuesday over the country's economic issues. Mark my words, Labour will raise you. your taxes. Thank it's you. in their DNA, your work, your car, your pension. Thank it you. was their first televised exchange ahead of the July 4th election that the ruling Conservatives appear set to lose. We will raise specific taxes, the super rich should be paying their tax. I want to get rid of the uh, equity loopholes that are there again for the super rich. And I think the oil and gas companies should be paying their fair share towards our energy. Sunak and Starmer both stuck to their campaign lines as they battled over how to tackle the cost of living crisis. The Prime Minister insisted only he had a plan to spur Britain's paltry economic growth while his rival portrayed the Conservatives as presiding over 14 years of economic chaos. Sunak was greeted by groans and laughter from the audience as the two traded barbs over the National Health Service. The NHS is still recovering from COVID and it is going to take time to recover from that. But we are now making progress. The waiting lists are coming down. Wait, you, you, 7.2 million. million, they're now 7.5 million. He says they're coming down and this and, is the guy who says yes. he's good at maths. Yeah, they are, they are now coming down. <laughs> they are now coming down. 7.2 yes. when you said you'd get them down. 7.2 million, they're now 7.5 million. I'd like you to explain how they're coming down. Because they were coming down from where they were when they were higher. 7.2. And they're now <laughs> on their way down. They are down, right? <laughs> Yes, oh. because the NHS was impacted by industrial action. Oh. And if it wasn't for oh. that, a half oh. a million appointments would have been saved. So it's somebody but else's fault. But the Prime Minister seemed to make up some ground with the audience on immigration, which has become a prominent concern among voters. Sunak stood firm on his proposal to send illegal asylum seekers to be processed in Rwanda and again painted Labour as lacking in plans. An opinion poll taken immediately after the debate suggested Sunak had won the contest. However, his campaign has been trailing behind Labour by about 20 percentage points in the polls. Adding to the ruling party's woes is polarising populist Nigel Farage's surprise announcement on Monday that he's running in the election. The Brexit campaigner is likely to peel off many right-wing voters from the Conservatives. Meanwhile, in Japan, a senior local official of Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party has urged Prime Minister and LDP President Fumio Kishida to step down to change the party's face at a time when it is struggling amid low public support due to a high-profile slush fund scandal. This is among an overall shaky political situation in the country. For updates on the ground, we have other than the world news special correspondent Rasita Chandradasa from Tokyo in Japan. What do you have for us, Rasita? Hi, I'm Rod. The whole world is taken by the election fever. So we just uh, had the Indian election where the opposition party gave a very good fight to the BJP. And we expected to have the UK, two big elections like UK and US elections. And in Japan, we also expect the general election by uh, at least by October. So that will be a massive fight between the, uh, the ruling LDP and the opposition CDP. But before that, in Tokyo, we have like a pre-exam, like a pre-election, which is a Tokyo governor election, which is expected to happen, which is called for July. And that's going to be a very exciting battle between two ladies. The present governor, the Koiko Yuriko, she's almost expected to stand for third term. She already completed two consecutive terms that she will stand for third one. It's going to face a strong battle from an opposition leader called Renho. So Renho comes from the opposition CDP and she is currently holding a, a position in the, uh, the, the upper chamber of the parliament. And people expect this to be a very close fight, especially considering the, uh, the Koike San's uh, supporters mainly come from the ruling LDP and they are expected to back her this time. With their popularity is waning and people are expecting, uh, uh, people, are, people want more other choices. And this battle, this the ladies' battle, going to heat up the Japan summer this autumn. All right, thank you very much for the update. That was other than a world news special correspondent Rasita Chandudasa from Tokyo in Japan. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news right after this.
Welcome back. We continue to bring you updates on the T20 World Cup matches that are currently underway. Nearly six months after the heartbreaking home loss in the ICC Cricket World Cup final to Australia, India begin their T20 World Cup 2024 campaign with almost the same star-studded lineup, but in a brand new stadium. The winners of the inaugural 2007 edition of the T20 World Cup face a strong Ireland side in their opening match in Group A at a Nassau County International Cricket Stadium all the way in New York. It's an interesting choice of attack from India, who won the toss and opted to bowl first. There's four seamers, including Hardik Pandya, but they haven't compromised on their spin options since they have Ravindra Jadeja and Aksar Patel. Arshdi bowled the first ball for India. Balburn and Sterling open for Ireland. The first boundary comes off the fifth ball of Siraj's over as Balburn gloves one down the leg side and there's movement as expected. The right-hander skies the first ball of Arshdeep's second over as he swings across the line and Pant takes the catch. Sterling's luck runs out as the Ireland skipper falls for two. And that wraps up all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. Stay tuned as Vinod Varnasurya will join you in just a moment with the nightly business report. Thank you for watching. Good night.